Hey everybody, this is Colin G. Murphy and welcome to show 32 of Colin Podcasting about real estate. Hope you're doing well today. My guest on this show is Mr. Eric Martel, a very experienced entrepreneur and an investor, French Canadian who bought his first apartment building at the age of 18, negotiating for seller finance. Unbelievable story. After that, they moved to California about 25 years ago where he made a fortune and lost it again during the crash, the technology crash in 2001. And then we talk about his slow transition back into the real estate game and how he built a very significant turnkey business with his two sons, one of whom, Antoine Martel, was on my show a couple of months ago. So great story, talk about a lot of stuff, uh, about what kind of characteristics you need to be successful, the importance of taking action, the importance of resilience, of market cycles, of earning active income versus passive income. So we, we touched on a lot of stuff here from a wise investor who's who's been around the block, which I think is very valuable, that experience. He is has a lot of experience and it's worth listening to. I think you're going to enjoy the show. Uh, but right before we head on over, don't forget to check out my website. I'm continuously tweaking it. ColinInvestments.com, C-O-L-I-N, investments.com. Check it out. Get on my Get on my mailing list. If you want to see some previews of some stuff I'm working on or some investments I'm working on, check out that. Get on the mailing list. And otherwise, uh, appreciate you listening to the show. Do give me a rating or review if you have a minute uh, before, during, and after the show. I'd really appreciate that. You'll find me on social media as always. But that's enough from me now. Let's head on over and see what we have to say with Eric Martel. Eric Martel, how are you doing, sir? Welcome to the show. Very good. Well, thank you, Colin. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm. Pleasure's all mine. So you, you've got a great career history, Eric, that's had a lot of ups and downs. I mean, can we, before we dig into the cool stuff that you're doing now with your family business, can you go back to the start and tell us a little bit about the place you grew up and if your family was entrepreneurial? So, yeah, my, uh, my family was not entrepreneurial. Actually, my family was very uh, kind of like lower, uh, lower income, kind of middle class, Mm -hmm. uh family working really the nine to five um my grandfather was a, a contractor so he was he has his own contracting company doing construction and he was mm -hmm. way more entrepreneurial than my parents were and so he was kind of like a, a little bit of an inspiration for me um but yeah this is uh yeah my parents very nine to five so what i learned from that is that i didn't want to be in that in that uh, very early on, I knew this is not what I wanted to uh, to be in. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the feeling that I wanted to build my own company and all of that. So, so that's it's kind funny. of. Uh, I've seen that a few times. So, a few of our guests had inspiration from a grandfather who was mm -hmm. a kind of built his own wealth and entrepreneurship, and then the parents were more predictable, nine to five, and then the grandson or the granddaughter were like, "No, I want to be more like my grandfather. I want to set up my yeah. own business." my own income streams yeah it skips a generation as they say that might be it well not in your case it <laughs> hasn't with, with your son i know he's very entrepreneurial as well yeah but... that's right well yeah when i when uh, you know antoine and Etienne, and my my two sons too like i didn't want them to you know i didn't want them to be like i said like polluted their mind polluted with corporate uh <laughs> yes corporate cubicle environment so uh yeah it worked out pretty well so talk to us then about your your early kind of work career. I mean, were you were you entrepreneurial in in high school in in college? Were you hustling? Were you were you working summers and winters? I mean, talk to us a little bit about your mindset. Yeah, I was very, I was very lucky. I mean, I was very fortunate my entire life. Um, uh, in high school, that was the best, probably the best time of my life because. And where was uh, this, by the way? Where did you Where did you grow I up? I was in north north of Quebec City. Okay. And, uh, and actually I could go back all the way to like fourth grade, uh, in elementary school where I just like, I, I throughout my uh, the education for me was a great, uh, it, it was fantastic all the way through it. In fourth grade, I, I read a book about, uh, and I said, I talked to the teacher and I said, Oh, I want to do a play about this book. And said, so, and she like looked at me like weird and said, wow. okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll do a play. And then, you know, so every time my whole life has been like that in, uh, in high school too, like I, I wanted to do start a club and stuff like that. And, uh, mm -hmm. after school club and say, okay, yeah, well, we'll help you. And, you know, and we'll have a teacher work with you on that and blah, blah, blah. And so every, all I've heard my whole life has been basically, yes, just, yeah, we'll, we'll help you. We'll support you. We'll, we'll do so. And I know that's not 
that's not the environment that everybody kind of uh, grew up in and you know but that's been my uh, how I grew up in my uh, my basically kind of like my journey. Yes, it's a double-edged sword as well, where, where if you have things very easy when you're a younger man, you can often get get a smack in the face when you're in your 30s when things don't work yeah. out. And we can we can maybe talk about that in a little bit. But do you remember, so where, when did you make your first kind of money? Was it like 18, 19? When were you kind of making money from your own initiatives or your own investments? So that's the first the first time that I bought an apartment building was uh, when I was 18 years old. I was still at university. And uh, I wow. had met, yeah, I had met a, a, a man like through a friend of mine that uh, he was a community college teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, he basically was, uh, he, he had started real, doing real estate investment from, uh, from the ground up, built an apartment building and like 36 unit apartment building and uh, did very well with that, continued to teach. But that's, you know, and and I knew that at that point I thought, okay, well, I need to, I need to absorb whatever this guy has done. I want to know how he did it, from uh, just being a community college teacher, and then you know, yeah, not much money or anything like that. So, so what was your involvement in that as as an eighteen year old? What did you do, or how did you get? I get did involved everything. <laughs> I did literally everything. I mean, he basically coached me. He said, oh yeah, you can totally do that. You can get an apartment building. And then I said, okay. And then, so what do I do? How do I get started? And he basically agreed to be my mentor for that. And mm -hmm. um, this is probably one of the one of the first time where I got a lot of resistance into what I was doing because I was working with a realtor who would, who kept telling me that oh, what I'm looking for doesn't exist. Like it's you know if 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 it existed, everybody would be doing it, right? So um, so then he gave me. This is the time when. Uh, you don't have like a, you can't just go on the internet and browse and filter through MLS. So he gave me a binder full of listings and stuff like that. And um, after weeks of me pestering him, and uh, he basically gave me the the listing, and I just went through it. It was like four binders, and I just like went did a calculation, looked at all of them, and found about two or three that would work out. But of course, I had no money. Yeah. Um, so not even money for the down payment. Uh, and um, so basically I ended up uh, having to find somebody that would be able to do a seller financing, you know, a second mortgage on, the, on that or vendor take back. And um, so that's, so I found one, one guy that was willing to do it. And uh, so, yeah, so that, that's how it happened. I mean, you found a guy that was willing to sell his house to an 18 year old and, and yeah. give him a second mortgage for the down payment. That's how good that port deal was. <laughs> <laughs> the man was a <laughs> the man well, was a little bit older. Must have been difficult to sell. <laughs> no offense to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was not you know it was not in the best uh, area of town. Uh, but impressive um, though, pull that off. Yeah, exactly. And at the time, I was not thinking of oh financial freedom or blah blah blah. I mean, I really latched onto this guy because he was a real estate investor, and mm -hmm. I. I you have to do something to if you want to learn this business i think you have to you have to go and do the transactions and and do the deals in yeah. order to really understand what's going on so that's that's why i did i did the deal i was 18 years old that you know you don't think financial freedom or anything like that how, how did it work out were you dealing with all the stuff yourself all the issues yeah so I was, that's units, the only problem yes yeah, exactly. So I, I, this is the only thing that I did wrong there, uh, where my mentor didn't really, uh, you know, help me with that because he was managing his own property. And he yeah. didn't think that I would need to have a property management company. So yeah, so that's the only thing. So I was doing the own property management. And uh, yeah, you, I learned very, the good thing is that I learned very early that I don't want to do property management. And yeah. uh, so I want to off, offload that to somebody else. But um, yeah, so that worked out pretty good. And that was a good test for me too, because that was like, how do you make money without spending the hours, the nine to five? And again, I wanted to, you know, not to be like my parents um, and, um, you know, be, be, uh, be a slave to the job. Kind yeah. Of thing. And give us a bit of context. When was this? Like, what was this the 80s, early 90s? Yeah, so it was 80s. So that was probably like 84, something like that, 83, 84. 
Yeah. Yeah. Because like nowadays, it's still impressive for a young person to buy an apartment community. No, no yeah. doubt. But now it's it's a lot easier to syndicate some money or to find yes, exactly. a mentor or pay for a mentor or research uh, all over the country for one that might match your That's criteria. Right. But back in your That's day, right. as you know, as a local realtor, it's a bunch of binders, like a bunch of phone books printed out. Yeah. And yeah. it's totally, totally different. Uh, That's right. And then the thing too is that it was the, that information was very well guarded. So there was no right. dissemination of information. If I knew, uh, you know, if, if I was a, a, a very good real estate investor, I wouldn't let just anybody in the circle. I wouldn't write a book about it mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, be on, on uh, YouTube and then telling people what, how to invest in real estate. There was none of that. It, every, all that information was very well guarded. And yeah. um, so that's why when this, this man uh, basically agreed to be my mentor, I knew like, you know, I wanted to learn as much as I can, could from mm -hmm. him. That's really cool. And so what happened after that? Did you continue investing or did you take a break and get a degree in a corporate job or, or a bit of both? How did it go? So I was, you know, I was studying in actuarial science uh, to be, become an actuary when I bought the building. So oh, okay. the building after, even after that, after full financing, it was still cash flowing. So I was making a little bit of money every month from that, about mm -hmm. $250 a month, if I remember correctly, in okay. that cash flow. So that was not bad for zero investment. Yes. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah, but then I, I had my job uh, that I wanted to pursue, which is the actuarial uh, career. And then I said, okay, well, so I started working as a consulting actuary, working in uh, pension. Uh, and basically at the time, there was a lot of uh, shift going on. So a lot of the, 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 what they call defined benefit pension plan. So where you have a pension plan that is, is calculated upfront based on your salary. So if you're an employee, you know that you're going to get 2% of your final salary uh times the number of years of service so if you worked somewhere for 50, 25 years you're going to get 50 percent of your salary as a in pension you know how much you're going to get every year or every month um, but there was a big shift at the time the co companies didn't want to have this liability over their head all the time sure. not knowing if they would have to write a check for a million dollars or if they would be positive on the on the reserve for these accounts mm -hmm. so there was i was every day i was just doing wind what they called winding down these uh these pension plan so basically converting these pension plan into defined contribution plan like 401ks right um and then that's that's a dramatic so it's kind of very difficult that. statistical work that kind of probably yeah that's right so that, what i like yeah, that's right. What I liked about that, about the actuarial science, is that you really bring the, the statistics with the finance um, together. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, and that's that's what I've been leveraging over the years too for other other careers and other businesses that I've done. I know because so, I grew up yeah. in, in Ireland and mm -hmm. when you're leaving high school, the you have a point system to get into different courses in university. And the, the yeah. one of the highest points, like you need literally an A1 in every single subject, even more than becoming a doctor, was to become yeah. an actuary so it was, yeah. it was yeah. something yeah, that right. the smartest kids automatically a lot of them just gravitated towards it because it was like the ultimate goal to get enough points to study to be an actuary so it, yeah. it must have been pretty difficult to, to get in in quebec as well mm -hmm. yeah oh yeah but I, I didn't make it all the way to be like a full fellow of uh, actuary, but uh, mm -hmm. I was I became an associate uh, actuary. So that's okay. when I, because you have to take a lot of exams after that. So it was like okay. 10, five years of exams. And it was like, it was insane. <laughs> and what um, did you, how long did you hang in there for? And what did you do? Next? I worked in an actuarial science for about uh, six years. Okay. And then, yeah. This is like but in your I, early 20s, right? I, I guess. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I was, but I was already looking at, so technology started coming out. Like, uh, you know, when I was in actuaria, we were working on IBM, uh, XT, you know, XT. <laughs> I don't, but not because, yeah. um, you know, I, I remember like my Commodore 64s and I, yeah, yeah. So know, that was my Windows three. And so, yeah, it was a little bit more than that, but yeah, it was like, uh, it was even before when there was no windows, it was DOS, it was still in DOS. And then, um, so yeah, so that's kind of how I got uh, started to do that when I was an actuary, this the tool mm -hmm. that we were using. 
Okay. And, uh, yeah, then, but then technology started picking up. So, and I was very interested in the technology piece of it. So, so that's so did when you I transitioned into technology then in what the mid 90s yeah. when things were starting yeah. to get super exciting. That's right. So then I started doing my, I start created my own consulting company to do that. And then, so I did a little bit of consulting uh, that went okay. It didn't do anything great. And then I worked and partnered with other companies uh, and then I got a lot more business. So that went very well. So then mm -hmm. I just kind of like took off that because I was more involved in enterprise uh, software and enterprise okay. uh, implementation. So that worked out very well. The rates were very, very high and very high demand. So it worked out good. And, it was uh, a funny time. I remember I was uh, yeah. doing an internship in San Francisco in 1999 in an mm -hmm. IT consulting group. And that was when just like a bunch of 25 year olds driving around in Porsches and yeah. mining yeah. and dining in the best restaurants. And I was, I was just, I was amazed at, at yeah. the, how was fun. crazy it was back then. <laughs> it was a dot com boom. So how did it, yeah. Were, you, were you investing during any of this, by the way? Were you adding to your rental portfolio would, during no, the 90s? No, just too, I bought too... a house. Mm -hmm. I bought a house and I did some uh, house hacking. And okay. uh, and I realized very quickly that I don't, I'm not made for house hacking. <laughs> uh, I value my privacy a little bit too much. And then, uh, so we had, we actually had a basement. I was living in Toronto at the time, Canada. Okay. And then, um, so yeah, we, we bought a house uh and then we um you know we finished the basement and rented the basement and okay. uh, yeah it was pros and cons I, I'm, I'm with you on that and uh, yeah. i think house hacking is great especially when you're you're younger when you want to yes. do that kind of stuff when you're young but when you're getting older you got you know living with a yeah. girlfriend or you're married it's you know if you can avoid it and buy rentals elsewhere yeah all, all yeah. The better. But yeah i've i've spoken to a lot of guests about the 2008 crash which is Kind of the first one a lot of our guests have had experience with but some yes. people forget there was a very big crash in 2001 as well in the technology yeah, that's the one that, that killed in. me <laughs> so, how, <laughs> so i guess you have a few scars from that do you eric yeah oh yeah absolutely oh my goodness the um yeah that 2000 so at, we arrived I, I transferred i was working for a big uh company at the time crm uh, customer relationship management software Mm -hmm. And um, so I had transferred from Canada to uh, to be at the head office of that company in um, in California. Okay. And we arrived in 2000, and I was just kind of like building, my, putting my team together, you know, in terms of the um, yeah, the CPA and all of that, and you know, and tried to figure out what the landscape was. And I had mm -hmm. a lot of stock options at the time, um, so that. That was phenomenal, but it was also a lot of money that was kind of on floating around on paper and it, it mm. seemed unreal. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, so that's the thing. It was about kind of like, how do I reinvest? I, want, I knew I wanted to diversify mm -hmm. and uh, I had started to look at uh, real estate. I wanted to go back to real estate and get some, some kind of rental properties. And uh, I mean, the numbers didn't make sense. The, yeah. uh, it was so expensive here. And so I talked to other real estate investors and they say, yeah, no, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I said, you have to go to Fresno, which is like three hours away. And, and I didn't know anything about Fresno and it didn't mm -hmm. seem that appealing and all of that. So I said, okay, well, so I diversified, but I diversified in, um, in the stock market. So Okay. And then the whole thing crashed, as you know. So my, a lot of my stock options actually went, uh, basically went almost to zero mm -hmm. so i lost a, i lost a, a lot of money at the time luckily i actually cashed in on some of the the stock options that i had Good. um but yeah i mean it was um uh, it was a uh, really bad that was very bad and, for pretty yeah. much everybody in the technology yeah. industry back then yeah my sure. wife was looking at me and saying wow you, you take it well it's like <laughs> but yeah because yeah it was a lot of money it's more money than uh because I remember going to the uh, the financial advisor and he said, oh, you've made it. That's it. You don't have to work anymore. You've made it. You just like just sell everything and you're done. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I don't know about I was afraid about the tax, the tax implication. There was some talk about AMT and all of that and how people sold their stock options and then they would they would go bankrupt because they had to pay AMT or something like that or lose their house or something. 
but anyway, so I decided to kind of like take it easy. But yeah, 2001, January 2001, that's when like everything for me that kind of uh, came to uh, collapse, basically. Yeah, shuddering halt. So yeah. So you've obviously dusted yourself down and, and moved on and achieved a lot of great stuff yeah. then. So how did you slowly, sounds like you slowly transitioned away from technology and, and back into real estate where yeah. you kind of mm-hmm. came full circle from when you started when, as a ambitious 18 year old buying that apartment building. Yeah. So I went, uh, but bef- even before that, I knew after, at the crash, I knew I said, okay, I want to get, I want to get more in control of what I, what I'm doing. Like I didn't mm-hmm. like the fact that this stock options just crashed on its own. I want to have something, some business that I control. I want to have mm-hmm. passive income because I want to, it was pretty obvious when you're working on contract as an independent contractor that, you know, every dollar you get is tied to an hour that you sold. Um, so I wanted to stop trading my time for money, move away from that. And um, so so that's when I, I was looking for other business. We started other businesses. My wife is, uh, is an entrepreneur as well. So okay. she was interested in starting a couple of businesses. So that she started a couple of things. We did a gourmet sauce company, for example. She did a oh. low carb grocery store. Mm-hmm. We did a lot of different things, and uh, and the goal was always for us to to generate passive income so that it would, um, yeah, it would run on its own. We could be anywhere in the world and still run the business. And mm-hmm. so these were some of the criteria that that we had. And then my. Uh, my younger son came to me one day and said, Hey, I want to, uh, I want to be a real estate investor. <laughs> and he was, I think he was 16. I think when oh, wow. he came to me. So, yeah. And then, so we started on that journey and then Antoine was, Antoine at the time was at university. So, and then Antoine came, came on at the time. Okay. And so then we, yeah, the three of us basically built the, uh, build a company. And, uh, and now my wife is also, quit what she was doing and now she's also uh working on the uh, on the real estate business so that, and give us a summary yeah. of what your, your current company does i mean and what what mm-hmm. assets you currently have so uh currently we're, we're doing turnkey rental uh we're a turnkey rental provider so we buy distressed property uh renovate uh-huh. them rent them out and then we sell them to investors who are looking to build a passive port a passive income portfolio to achieve financial freedom or retire gotcha. or retire early Mm-hmm. And um, so we think it's a great investment. And in fact, when we before we even got into that uh, turnkey provider business, uh, we were just doing it for ourselves. Uh, but then we had friends and families that started asking questions about, uh, hey, what, what are the Martels up to? What are they doing? And, <laughs> you know, this we had busy. done all kinds of different, <laughs> well, you know, we've done a, all kinds of different businesses. So people were always curious to know what we were up to. Okay, um, yeah. So, so then, yeah, we just said, hey, we're doing this. And, said, yeah. and then, so there was an interest in people investing with us at the time. And it just kind of grew from there. And then shortly after we said, well, we could sell uh, some of these properties to other people. And then that's how the business started. Mm-hmm. I think that year we did, um, we did like 10 and then 20 and then 40. And then last year we did like 85 and then this uh, in 85 single family and then last uh, this year we were supposed to do 120 but then you know with coronavirus yeah, yeah. we're going to do around 85 90 again this year oh, that's pretty solid given the inventory yeah. constraints and so yeah, what I know, were you was... using the the money from all those flips to do i mean you don't look like the guy who's just using it to buy you know a porsche or, or a mansion I mean, no we're we applying it into some other kind of family asset so obviously the business and then multifamily. And so we uh, started investing also in uh, apartment buildings. So we have like five apartment buildings in uh, Midtown Memphis. Great. And we renovated them. Um, so some of them are, are different stages, but so three of them right now have been completely renovated. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're just kind of like uh, finalizing them right now. And they're, they're for sale. So we're actually selling them. Um so that's uh, and then the other two, then we're going to the other two that are not complete, then we're going to finalize the renovation and do the same. So that's kind of like a turnkey, but on the apartment building size. Um, okay. So that about 20 units, like mid, fairly not a big, not a big apartment building that would you require like syndication, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but mid, very good size, 20 unit. It's uh, 
we really like that that space okay so yeah. how would you say then that you've that real estate has helped you to achieve financial independence i mean has it it's obviously it's helped you a lot increase your active income from all the turnkey how are you using it to to boost your future passive income as well when you're when you want to retire yeah so i mean right now i mean the apartment buildings i think for the long term that was kind of like the um you know the plan was the apartment building would provide you know passive income for the future obviously mm -hmm. i'm i'm in this full time so that's providing uh income for for me and my family but i had I, the advantage that i have is that i have two uh younger adults adult children that are actively involved in the business and uh awesome. I sat down with them and I said, so what do you want to, what do you want to do with this business? Like, do you want to just get it to a certain level, which is, which is a, you know, it's not a bad goal either mm -hmm. to just keep it to a certain level so that you have, you can live well and you can travel and you can do whatever you want. Or do you want to just like take it to the max and see where this, uh, where this goes? So, you know, these are two different options. You don't have to take everything to the max. You can just kind of like leave it at a certain level. And then, but yeah, they wanted to, uh, to really uh, take it up as far as they could. So that's why we kind of look, look at repositioning and looking at the, uh, like now selling the apartment buildings and then uh, putting more money in the turnkey side, looking at different markets and all of that. Yeah. And, and, and I see that. You know, you, you, you kind of start off saying, well, let's because I've, I've flipped hundreds of houses in Tampa over the last few years. And you say, well, if I can do 20 this year and 40 next year and then 60 next year, I'll be I'll be pretty set. You yeah. Know, and, you know, theoretically, OK, but you never really want to stop. You know, you just want to keep learning and yeah. keep trying new things and see and kind of push yourself to see what what you can do next. And it sounds like your your family's done that. You've you've bought enough apartments to kind of, you know, sit back and relax. But yeah, you had too much fun doing it, and you want to do. But what would I do? You know, like just nothing good on TV, as I always say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't even have cable. I have. I watch on the. I watch YouTube all the time. I so but look, uh, you you get a lot of peace of mind just from having the option to yeah. chill out or having the option yeah. to take a month off. You don't need to actually do it. Um, yeah. I mean, I do recommend taking time off, but it, it is. You know the, the real stress comes from working hard and and still not being comfortable with your That's financial right. stability i mean what is it you know what do you think it is uh what, what's the thing preventing people from achieving that kind of peace of mind that kind of comfort what what's holding them back or what barriers are out there yeah i think so uh yeah to that point i think this, this is absolutely right i mean when i was working full-time and i was an independent con consultant uh i was always worried like what if my gig or my contract ends you know like the company uh decide oh you know this project is um there's no value in us so we're canceling the, the project all of a sudden like like this you're without money coming in and i have to find another contract and it could take two three i mean you know i have I had very specialized uh, skills so mm -hmm. it could take like three months to get another contract and so Every time I was always worried, oh, I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose the house. I'm going to lose this or I'm going to go bankrupt or, uh, you know, and now I don't have that worry at all. Now I know, I know exactly what's going on. I, I know the trends of the business and all of that. And our joke is all, uh, our backup plan is always like, if things go wrong, I mean, we just shut everything down and then we just go to a cheaper place to live and, yeah. um, you know, and just wait, wait it out. So. But I think a lot of, um, to answer your question, I think a lot of the people that, uh, why they don't, they have a problem getting there and like some of the barriers that they have, I think beside, beside beliefs uh, is, um, is taking action. So many people think that oh, because they have an idea that, oh, my idea is the business and uh, all of that. And, but mm -hmm. it's really in the execution. The idea is not that important. There's a lot of people that make a lot of money doing very, uh, not interesting business. Sure. Uh, you know, you people that make money in the scratch. I was read, watching an art, reading an article yesterday or the day before about a guy that made millions of dollars running a scrapyard. You know, there you go. and go it's figure. just like, yeah. 
but you know this is not this is not a glamorous business by all means but he made he made a lot of money and um doing he's that he's clearly and, very uh, good at running scrapyards exactly. compared to exactly. other guys running scrapyards he, he knew it he always comes to execution right mm -hmm. so execution and taking action and uh, i had the same like so these the companies that i started to I, I started some companies with partners and then uh, like the first technology company consulting company that i started i had two other partners mm -hmm. and uh they didn't do anything they i was doing everything mm -hmm. and then uh it was like like why am i having partners and why aren't you like you wanted to do this business like that means you want to participate and uh but no, it's it's very interesting to see that, like the human nature, how it is. And they think that things happen. Yeah. They think that and it's the same. It's kind of like determinism. You know, they're just like, oh, things happen to them on a negative way. But they also think that uh, their payoff and their wealth also happens to them, like without them being involved. And um, so it, does, it doesn't work like that. So obviously. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's it. I mean, yeah, just just wanting the financial freedom and, and wanting mm -hmm. not to worry every day is is not enough. I mean, there's there's yeah. you have your escape valve somewhere. You can go for a jog or you can you know drink a glass of whiskey, and that's all fine for a bit of escapism. But if you actually want to solve the problem, you need to you need to yeah. take action. I mean, what yeah. what are the steps then? I mean, give give me the steps for someone who's you know, maybe been on that corporate treadmill for longer than they'd like, maybe their mid 40s, early 50s or whatever. And now they're worried that, oh, I should have been doing stuff when I was younger. What, what, what do right. I do now to, to, to make up for last time? What, what, what do you recommend? I mean, what are their Yeah, I think steps? if you're, if you're in your 40s and 50s, I think this, this is really the perfect time because you still have a little bit of ways to go before retiring. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you may be able if you do act and you take proper action and stuff like that you may actually be able to retire earlier than uh and then enjoy your life when you're still healthy but uh i think the the first thing is uh, everyone's number one goal should be to achieve financial freedom that's the number one goal for everybody uh and the reason is that once you buy back your time then you can go and invest in anything else you want and you can enjoy life and spend more time with your family and all that uh, if you have, a, if, and if you want to go and get a W two job, a nine to five job, you can also do that. That doesn't mean that you have to quit your job, but mm -hmm. at least buy. I have the ability to buy back your time, and then that's the number one uh, goal. Then it's uh, what are the strategies? What are the different ways to achieve financial freedom? So you have to look at your resources. Like how much time you have to invest? How much money you have to invest? um what are kind of like any kind of special skills that you have and then you kind of focus on that so real estate is probably the easiest um thing to understand in terms of uh, skills uh is especially if you're looking at single family rentals but it doesn't yep. have to be limited to that i mean if you know how to, if you have some special skills you can write a book if you have some uh, uh if you have intellectual properties in something you can patent it or whatever but so that's the uh, that's the idea. But rental, I think uh, single family rental is probably open to everybody. And yes, you can do it on your own. But if the next constraint I think that most people have is the money and the time. So mm -hmm. uh, so if, you, if you're working full time, sometimes like 60 hours a, a week, uh, yeah. then you don't have time to really look at uh, these uh, properties or manage properties or do some of the heavier like uh, involvement yeah, or even, kind of even the build the teams because that takes exactly. a long time as well exactly. you gotta go through a few bad eggs to get the good ones as well exactly and so i think that's the uh, that's the advantage that's what we bring to the table with the turnkey rental properties is that everything is done for you you basically come up to the down payment and then you have something that's cash flowing from day one then build your portfolio to a certain to a certain point and then once you have bought back your your time then you can invest in other things that are more time consuming and really learn everything else that needs to to be learned around uh, around investing and build a team and all of that but i think that's um that's the critical part and then obviously taking action <laughs> you know yeah. actually move, going through with it there's a lot of advantages also i mean we once you even if you have a w2 i think it's great if you have a w2 income because then you can get mortgages for your rental yeah. properties 
-hmm. you also have a lot of uh, you know you have depreciation taxable uh, tax deductions too that you can take advantage of so these rental properties actually help you a lot quite a bit on your ta on reducing your taxes mm -hmm. and then to invest even more the following years so you do people forget that but if you can earn an extra fifty thousand dollars let's say from rental properties you're going to get taxed much less than that than you would for yep. fifty thousand dollar bonus at Christmas from your exactly. Your boss. I mean, exactly. Or selling stocks that you just bought on the <laughs> yes, you know, the, on a short term gain, capital gain. I mean, you just pay ordinary income. But the night, the thing is with these rentals that even if you have a net cash flow, let's say of five hundred dollars a month, mm -hmm. your depreciation often is going to come to about four hundred and five hundred dollars a month as well. So you you almost zero out. Your, your net cash flow, you still have the cash flow in the bank, the cash in the bank. Yes. But in terms of the IRS, that's not, uh, you don't have to pay taxes on the bulk of it because of depreciation. It is, it's, it's a, yeah, it is, it is a great thing. And, and you don't get that in every country either, by the way, no. I've, I've rented oh, yeah, that's in, true, in yeah. other places in Europe and you don't have that, unfortunately, but yeah. a lot of good stuff here that, that you can enjoy for sure. And mm -hmm. let, let me flip that kind of scenario around a little bit. You've just kind of spoken about, you know, people in their 40s and 50s who really need to take action if they spend 15, 20 years not taking action for their financial freedom. And, and the flip side of that is somebody younger, mid-20s, mm -hmm. late 20s, and maybe they've already been making money in real estate. We've, we've had such a good bull run, literally like a 10, 11 years of just sunshine and clear skies as far yeah. as investing in real estate is always going up the rents are always going up you get broken boilers and roofs or whatever but in terms of the market and the average price per square foot is just going one direction and that makes it pretty mm -hmm. easy for a hard-working young guy to make a bit of money but yeah i think you know have you any lessons to, you know or warnings for these young bucks that you've, you've been around the, the block a couple of times and can you speak to us a little bit about the necessary you know that you need that resilience that you got to you got to expect those storm clouds are going to come sooner or later. And what, what kind of stuff should they be prepared for? Yeah. I mean, I think the, um, I think it's important to have these two things. I think it's important to have a long-term horizon investment mm -hmm. horizon. Uh, people tend to be like very short focus, especially they're looking at the stock market and all of that. And everything is like very quick. This yeah. is the real estate. You have to think about it in terms of, uh, of a very long term. Mm -hmm. And uh, like that's what they always say, you know, it's always a good time to invest in real estate, you know, and then the mm -hmm. best time to invest in real estate was yesterday or that's the other one too that they would say as because it really, I mean, it's just uh, on when you look at it over a very long period of time, you look at any charts in terms of rents or property value, it's always it's always an uptrend. Yep. Right. So. Yeah, there's a even if you look at 2008 and stuff like that, yeah, it goes down, but it, it comes back up. And so if you look at if you have an investment horizon of, you know, 50 years, if you're 20 years old, 20 years old, you have an investment horizon of 50 years or whatnot or more. Mm -hmm. uh, this, you know, yeah, there's going to be ups and down. But, you know, in the end, you're going to be much better off uh, when you're when you're in your 70s with these uh, properties and you can take you can take action too like you can even if you can leverage some more as the property value increases as you pay down your mortgage and stuff like that you can then leverage that asset and then buy more uh, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that can be done too um so in terms of uh so i think that's that's the advantage of, uh, of real estate and i think the um yeah, there's some scenarios where you, you're going to end up that, oh, my, my apartment is vacant or my single family uh, rental is vacant. And mm -hmm. this is why you want to have more than one. You want to build a portfolio and, be, and continue to build that portfolio. Even though you have like one tenant that may have moved out and then you have a month of, uh, you know, that you don't have rent, um, rental income, you know, that's, that's fine. You just keep building. The more, the more units that you have, uh, the less risk you have actually in the, in that because you have if you have one and you have one tenant that's left obviously you you lose a hundred percent of your rental revenue but if you have one person that leaves and you have twenty then you know it's one over twenty in terms of uh, I don't, I'm not very good at math <laughs> no you're, you're you're right I mean the, the most yeah. the most stressed landlords I've spoken to and I know 
are the ones that have less than five rentals. They're the most stressed because there's always mm-hmm. something happening yeah. and they're generally dealing with it directly themselves. They're often managing them directly. They're often figuring out how do I get a new fridge to this house? I need to get a quote for a new roof where I'm going to find 10,000 bucks or how, you know, they're always stressed out about something or this guy's late again. What am I yeah. going to do? Do I need to get a, an eviction person after them? There's, they get very stressed out. Um, oh, yeah. But if you talk to someone who has mm-hmm. 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, and you said you get stressed out about appliances and late payments yeah. and CapEx items, they're like, no, I don't get stressed out. I don't lose any sleep over that stuff at all because yeah. they've, they've got exactly. their systems, they've got their teams, they've been there, they've done that, and they're not stressed at all because, and, and like you say, they have the law of averages. If there's a couple of units giving them grief, there's, you know, 90, the other 90% are humming along and are kind of covering the slack for the ones that aren't. So yeah. if anybody's listening and they're kind of worried, about having twice the grief from going from three rentals to six, it, it generally goes the other way because mm-hmm. you have more people helping you and you have more managers and you have more contacts and you have a better network. It actually gets easier the more you work your way up the ladder, uh, I found. Yeah. And for us, like we also put, I mean, we, we recommend that you know, all our investors that they, they use a property management company don't mm-hmm. make the same mistakes that I did when I was 18 and then buy, buy a property and then think that you can manage it yourself. You don't, you don't want to do that. You want to work on building your portfolio and then uh, building a system and, you know, so that you can, you, you don't want to be dealing with uh, toilets and. Uh, you, you don't want to be like doing that. the $10 an hour jobs, really. You exactly. want to be using your time for the thousand dollar an hour jobs, which is exactly another one. Right. And, and you, the other thing too is that, yeah, you're right. I mean, even people that have property management uh, company in place, they kind of uh, are upset also about certain certain things. I mean, they uh, we had some calls about some one person that uh, she was she was upset he or she was upset that uh, something they, they had to fix a, a light fixture or something like that, and it was costing them like twenty five dollars, and it's mm-hmm. like. So twenty five dollars that should cost like two dollars at Home Depot and stuff like that. And I said, well, yeah, but the guy has to go and go drive his truck, you know, and go there and do that. Make sure he has everything that uh, he knows what the problem is. Then you may have to go get a part and come back and do this, fix it. Uh, you have to, you know, you have to pay for that. If you're just looking at oh, the light switch costs like two bucks, why didn't you? Why do I have to pay twenty five bucks for that? Well, yep. yeah, that's that's why. But you don't want it's well worth the price when you look at it uh, then uh, and not having to worry about that then uh, start worry about all these details it's just um, but again there are some people that even that is is too much for them even if it's all managed it's too much for them but then there are other alternatives as well that they can do to generate passive income mm-hmm. i mean they could they could become like a private money lender they could do hard money lending. They could do. Uh, they could invest. Participate in a, in a syndication where they don't have to take any decisions. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So there, there are other options as well if you really don't want to own uh, own own a rental. Mm-hmm. You're right. I mean, it, it, yes, you're right. There, and there's there's ones where you're just earning interest and you're not owning an asset. And there's other ones where you're a minority owner owner of an asset, but you're not taking yeah. any decisions and you're not deciding when to refinance exactly. or when to sell. There's, there's pros and cons for them all. Um, yeah. But the main theme, I think, from this conversation is don't just sit there and think about it. You need to actually do exactly. it and, and, and play around with it and try different strategies and see which one you like. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Well, this has been... That's, uh, but that's also, I would say, once you pick a strategy, because that's mm-hmm. the other thing to that, the counter side to this is that I see a lot of people that are switching strategy uh, all the time. So we look at the resource. And so if you switch strategy, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you switch strategy, make sure that you have a reason for that, that this is not this is not for me. Like if you try a single family rental and then you say, you know what, I whenever I look at the owner report, like it just really bothers me this or that or, you know, I just can't stand it and uh, blah, 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 then okay, maybe you, that strategy is not for you. Like you, you want to be able to sleep at night. And if you can't, then it's not a good strategy. So maybe you need to move something else. Maybe PML is better. But I see a lot of people that, you know, they just keep switching strategy because they, they follow the returns, but they don't have the right resources in order to, to get there, to do that. 
they either don't have the time to do that or they don't have the money to do that they don't have the skills to do that and then they just uh, they end up in a situation trying to implement a strategy that's not going to work for them or they're going to lose money or they're going to spend a lot of time to figure out that this is not for them either so yeah you're, you're right there is a lot to be said for for scaling and uh, you know even me personally i used to be buying real estate all over the map and it was only really when i started focusing on a certain type of property in, in certain neighborhoods in a well-defined area and and got very good at it and got become an expert in a handful of, of subdivisions that's when you have yeah. success and yeah, exactly. obviously once you have that so I think that the kind of maybe the, the the balance of our two answers is that you need to be you need to go deep on your active income when you want That's to right. scale something up. But if if you've made all that money and you want to spread it around a bit passively, then yeah, you can dabble in different types of things mm. from there. Yeah, yeah, I think it's important to go deep. I think people tend to be like very um, superficial in terms of so if you find something a system that makes money, mm-hmm. then try to make more money using that system try to scale it scale it up try to you know find the uh, make it more efficient and stuff like that and um I, and if you're bored that's probably good. a good thing it's probably a sign yeah. you're on the right track <laughs> once you set it up make it passive right so it's the same thing like what we're we want to do with also with martel turnkey it's kind of like then we hire we build the systems we build the processes we build mm-hmm. all of that we want we're hiring more people to kind of manage all that and build a team and then we can just uh, kind of stand back and look at other markets look at uh, other things at a at the strategy for the overall company not at the actual execution but yeah it all it comes down to execution in the end is so so it's important to spend spend the time and then kind of if you find a, a formula that works just just keep at it and make it better and make it more profitable for you that's brilliant. It sounds like you have a lot of exciting things ahead for, for Martel oh, yeah. Turnkey, Eric, and uh, appreciate you sharing your, your wisdom with us today. How can people learn more about you if they want to get in touch? So there's my website, MartelEric.com, and in there you can see all my social media as well as my book, Stop Trading Your Time for Money. Uh, it's available on Amazon as well. Okay. Uh, you can reach me on Instagram at E underscore Martel mm-hmm. uh, or on Facebook, Eric.Martel.ca. Perfect. I will put those on the show notes, sir. And, and thanks again for your time. I really enjoyed the Very conversation. Good. Well, thank you, Colin. It was great. There you go, folks. That was show 32 with Mr. Eric Martel. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I certainly enjoyed uh, talking through his significant ups and downs. What a great story he started off with as an 18-year-old without any connections, uh, except a mentor negotiating the purchase of an apartment building at 18. I mean, what are most of us doing at 18, right? I mean, drinking beer and chasing girls, certainly not thinking about buying apartment buildings. That was certainly the furthest thing from my mind when I was 18 years of age. So fair play to Eric for getting started so young. And he's done a lot since then. He's, he's set up a lot of different businesses. He's made a lot, made fortunes, lost fortunes, made fortunes again, which is a testament to his resilience and the resilience all entrepreneurs need if they want to still be in the game a few decades from now. But I think it's, you know, Eric could be the first to admit that having that real estate made all the difference to him and he's able to build up that real estate portfolio, those apartment communities, building that turnkey business made a huge difference. And yeah, real estate is, is really quite unique when it comes to being able to create that financial freedom, building up those passive income streams or active income streams if you want to spend some time doing it. A lot of ways to make money in real estate and buying turnkey rentals is absolutely one of them, especially if you really enjoy the job you're doing and or if you're making good money doing the job you're doing. Keep saving up for those deposits, keep building up those active income streams and it will pay off very handsomely in the end. And keep networking, guys. I hope you're you're trying to spend time with fellow real estate enthusiasts, both people below you in the ladder that you can help up and people above you that you can learn from and emulate. There's a lot of fun to be had doing that. And uh, I hope this show is, is helping you a little bit to open your eyes to the, the possibilities out there, whether, you know, there's all sorts of ways of making money. I try and get a good variety in my guests. Hope you're enjoying that. I've got many more lined up for the first quarter of 2021. And your feedback is always appreciated, as is a visit to colininvestments.com. If you want to check out the website, get on my mailing list. 
give you some sneak previews of investments I'm working on, videos I'm working on, reports I'm working on. So do head on over there and uh, leave me a rating or a review if you have a minute and haven't done so yet. That is always appreciated. But that's it from me. I'm not going to take up too much more of your time, guys. I'll leave you alone to do whatever you're doing. But Colin G. Murphy here signing out. Appreciate all your support. Bye-bye. Thank you.